a, a small uh, study we have done. And uh, we have done a study between a lot of operators in Europe because that's the, the topic what we're going to have, how to conquer Europe. What's the right strategy to tackle Europe? And we ask a bunch of operators and a bunch of brand owners, what's the most important thing when you look into a country? Uh, how you decide if you enter the country? And you see on the bubble size here that most of the guys answered it's the size of the price. The bigger the country, the bigger the cake, the more hassle, the mu much hurdle I take to enter the stage. And then we ask which country is the most attractive one. And uh, these brands here, and you, you know all of them, they answered the question. So we contacted each of them and said, give us the answer. And the result is still UK. So we're going to talk about that. We all talk about Brexit. We all talk about the, the high rents and all the hurdles. But still the answer, if you ask all these operators, and again, that's quite a lot of operators, which European country is most attractive to enter, you got... UK, France, Netherlands, uh, in Germany. We also saw in the presentation from Steph that you have not a lot of chains here. It's a lot of independent restaurants, so there's a lot of room for us organized F&B hospitality concepts to grow. So UK is dominated by high real estate prices and rates, the heavy competition, but there's a reason why there's heavy competition, and we're going to talk about the Brexit. Um, all these presentations will be shared. I just run quickly through because we want to go through the, through the panels. Yes, UK is increasing costs and the risk of Brexit, but there's still the size of the price. Germany, the home country of Johannes from Losteria, is defined by finding partners very difficult. There's not just a lot of strong franchise operators. There are a lot of my friends coming and said, with whom should we work in Germany? I said, there's no professional franchising structure, not a lot of professional strength. There's not a strong franchising culture. Germans are very risk averse, as we all know, and you have a very low price point. So with every concept, what has a high price point in food and beverage to end Germany would be quite risky or tricky. Um, so you see challenging search you find rather easy partner, the panel said, in UK and in Spain. It's easy to find the right partner. We will talk about that. And it's quite tricky to find the right partners on the other side of Europe. France, there was a lot of questions and good answers about France. France is dominated by having a really high price point. So you saw also the guys who visit uh, of you, uh, Paris more often, you see a lot of fast casual concepts spreading in France because you find great operators, you also find a good franchising culture, you have uh, high sales prices, but on the downside, you have quite high uh, rental prices. So now I want to introduce my panel and also sit with them to discuss how we enter Europe. The great thing is, I said that before in my uh, intro, you have here guys on stage and I just strongly recommend you to grab them uh, in, in the break. These four guys here on stage run over 2,500 restaurants in over 30 countries. So we can talk about growth, but I want to start with you, Malain. You handle the international business of HMS Host, uh, over 19 countries, and the, the difference in your business model, you run locations in train station, you run locations on airport, but also on shopping center. But here now in the panel, you represent the Netherlands. So you're also the ambassador of Netherlands. And we saw in the presentation before, there's quite a white space to enter. So everybody here, a lot of people here think we have 40 people, 40% uh, of the people who haven't thought about doing business here before, so all your colleagues from around the world, why should they enter Netherlands? And if they decide to come and bring their concepts here, what should they watch out? What's the tricky thing in this country? Thank you, uh, Mario. So uh, I'm really privileged to be a, a Dutch uh, foodie and also uh, based in the Netherlands working for 19 countries. Um, if you look at the trends which are going on, we saw this morning as well uh, talking about portabilization, portability, premiumization, but also personalization. So those are the main three trends going on in the Netherlands. And as you can see on my slide, the restaurant <coughs> business is really booming. Um, if, if we look at the airports where our main business is, um, the airport business consuming F&B is really influenced uh, by the increasing uh, of spend of retail. So 
retail spend is going down, FSB spend is going up, and once people spend money on F&B, food and beverage, they tend to spend money in retail as well. So F&B is the, is the future. And as we're all here, a lot of foodies, but also investors, I think it's really uh, wise to look at your service model. Uh, so I'm not going to recommend any brands, uh, as we're all here with brand experts, and uh, we like to host them all. Um, but it's really about service models. So in the Netherlands, restaurant business is booming, but the consumer is much more demanding on the service model. So they tend to get more than three meals a day. So that means that you need to serve the people at the moment they want to be and at the moment they are in the restaurant. Uh, so that's one of the big trends which is going on, which also uh, gives you a focus on uh, what to serve when. Um, and I think as a watch out, well, we mentioned it before, we've seen it before, it's staff. So if we speak about service, there's really a, a, a lack of staff and, and a really highly trained staff. Um, and uh, I know because I've, well, a lot of people I know as well are, have done hotel school. I'm the privilege to have done the hotel school The Hague. Uh, but if you look at the profession of hospitality, it's not the real profession anymore as it used to be. So if you work in a restaurant, and you don't see that here, luckily, in the NH Hotel, because it's really professional, but it, it's not a profession anymore. So my, my big watch out, and, and I think we're all responsible for, for guiding that as, a, as foodies and F&B specialists, is, is that we really need to encourage that uh, uh, hospitality and food and beverage is really a nice place to work, and it's really a profession where you can grow in and become, you know, and reconnect with, uh, with the humans. True. You travel a lot and you have a lot of relationship with international brands. Is there any specific brands you think what is missing or cuisine where you say, I will put my money that this works here? Is there anything where you say, this will rock here and I don't get why they're not here yet? Uh, well, it's, it's funny as you say because we, uh, we took over some brands uh, and we introduced that from the UK, uh, the growing market in the Netherlands, uh, like Lyon and uh, like Comptoir Libanais. Uh, but I think if you focus on the Dutch uh, in Dutch brands, uh, a lot of Dutch brands can have uh, similarities across countries. Um, but it's really recommendable to focus on what the need is of the food. Uh, so in the Netherlands, um, depending on where you are, it's all about coffee and cake or bread and cheese. Um, and we just opened a new restaurant in, in Utrecht Stadskamer last week. Uh, amongst a lot of international franchise brands which are really doing well. And we opened a new one which is selling bread and coffee and it's, it's booming. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's about the food and it's about the item which is attracted. And then you should focus also on, on the trends like uh, health, vegan, uh, and then build a concept or brand around it like these guys are doing as well. Thank you. So I want to switch to Olo. Uh, up one, one slide enough. So you're one of my, my heroes out there because we all run a lot of restaurants, but Emrest and Olo, as a CEO of Emrest, they run over 2,100 restaurants. What is really it crazy? It's like eight times more than everybody else here on, on stage. <laughs> and I remember when we met two years ago, we met at one of the openings in uh, in Wroclaw, and we opened there a piano. I remember it was November, and I was so proud, and I said to you and your development director, I said, we're going to open six more restaurants this year, because it was November, and to open six restaurants in the last six weeks is quite uh, impressive. And then uh, I turned to you and, and you said, yeah, how many we opened? So they opened 65 more this year. So this year, I think your plan is to open over 350 restaurants a year. Um, so it's about growth we talk about. We also want to talk about how you focus, how you decide where to put the money, where to put the energy. You run multi-brands, uh, own brands, your franchise O, your franchise E, and you run basically the whole European landscape. And like everybody else, you have limited funds uh, and limited resources on people. How you focus and how you decide what to do? Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. And I just wanted to confirm one thing. I'm not running all those restaurants. We have a great people uh, within our team, and uh, we believe in the ownership that we give to the presidents of the brands, and actually they are doing the job. And I think that's, that's, that's actually the answer to, to your question. Uh, 
we really believe in this ownership, that whether those are the franchise brands or those are the proprietary brands, we want to make sure that the brand presidents own the strategy of the brand, including development, including uh, all the aspects how to make the brand relevant. And this is, this is how we start the whole discussion in terms of the brand's development. And if we feel like there is a need for the brand which is not included in our portfolio, then we start looking for, uh, for, what, else, uh, for what else is there. Um, obviously, with, um, with right now having, the, having both and franchise and, and proprietary brands, we have to run a little bit different agenda for, um, for those, I would say, two different categories. Uh, with, with most of the franchise brands, we have a certain development agreements um, um, that obviously have also a certain number of openings planned within, the, within uh, a time frame and within geography. Uh, at the same time, we were very careful in terms, of, in terms of site selection. I also believe that the time when you know, the franchisors are thinking about just the numbers of opening is it, not the right anymore. I think that you know, in today's environment, in the environment which has been you know, disrupted by, the, by food technology, uh, we really have to shift our thinking in terms of how we can get to the customers in, through different ways, including the traditional brick and mortar, but also through, through, some, other, through some other channels. So for the franchise brands, the, the big part for us is, is, uh, is related to those development agreements. And the good news is that for, for every franchise brand that we have, uh, there's still a huge space to grow. Uh, what we found out is that within this model, uh, the, the, the penetration helps frequency. I think that's been proven by many, brand, many international brands so far, and, and, and we've been observing this uh, very much in, in most of the countries that we are in. So sometimes we feel like there is a penetration, and then just by figuring out different, different type of the assets, we are opening a new, potential for, a new potential for brands. With proprietary brands, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, there's been a, quite a big shift for our organization recently from being a brand operators, a brand opera brands operator, into a franchisor. So we have more and more franchise brands. So that's been done together with the franchise community. And that obviously requires a different strategy. So uh, we strengthen our uh, team right now, um, adding a, a really strong um, franchise person uh, who will definitely make a step change in terms of the way how we run um, franchising. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that uh, uh, the tool will have the, will have the balance uh, development with both equity as well as the franchise uh, restaurants open. Thanks. Short second question, because you really run a wide uh, a variety of countries. Most easiest one and most complicated one in Europe, if you have to choose one, what would, <laughs> you, what would you answer? You don't need to give the reason, but just to get the feeling if it's the same as we got here in the result. What's the easiest one for you? to enter, to start? The easiest one is, is the easiest as for us as the regions, obviously, Central Europe. And the part of it is coming from our, from our experience. We've been in Central Europe, we've been in Poland for 25 years. So, so obviously, if we, if, we are, if we are doing something in Poland, uh, the whole process, the fact that we have uh, you know, our office and, uh, and, and many supportive functions in Poland, that makes our life much easier. And, and Obviously, if we go to China, where we have uh, Blue Frog, uh, for example, that's a, dif that's a different story. But I think that once, once you have a strong systems, strong operations, as you know, that this is, this is one, of the, one of the key pillars of, of Amra's success over the last 25 years. So if you have a strong operations, and if we are working hard in terms of making brands relevant, even the existing brands, to keep the relevancy, uh, then I think that, you know, the question is, the question is, is more related to where's, where's the better, where's the bigger space? Cool, thanks. So Nick doesn't need so much introduction. Uh, he's a Griff fans, uh, friend and fan since, since early days. Uh, Nick did a great job and we met very often uh, on stage uh, over the years by growing uh, the Jamie Italian. He now took over the Vapiano family to grow. But besides all your international experience, and we will reflect that in the second question, you are a British ambassador here. And uh, you saw the, the result of the survey where still most of the fast casual brands um, really aim to go to UK. But you also, you live there, you, you operate a business there, you have all the, the risks going on around Brexit, but even before crazy real estate uh, everything what we what we learned. So from having an international mindset, but still living there and spending money, 
What's your recommendation on uh, for the continental brands? Is it necessary to grow into London? What's the watch out or what's your recommendation on that? It's funny, we were actually just chatting about it during the break, uh, Johannes and I. Um, because I've spent the majority of my time both for Jamie Oliver and now obviously stepping into your shoes at Vapiano and, and Chris's, looking at the international market and seeing the amazing possibilities in markets such as Poland, France, Germany, uh, the ones that you've mentioned there. And then, as you say, still living in the UK, I'm sort of still surprised when chatting to people and they say, I say when you look at Europe, say if you're chatting to an American brand or even Dubai brands, um, from the Middle East or, or, or from Southeast Asia, and they sort of predominantly do focus upon Europe as the number one choice, sorry, the UK as the number one market that they'd like to enter in Europe. And I'm sort of looking at it knowing what I've experienced through the Jamie Oliver um, and Jamie's Italian specific experience on the UK high street and chatting to other UK operators, you're sort of a bit bewildered by it because there is huge potential but in that casual dining scene, it's incredibly saturated. Um, it's highly, uh, highly, highly competitive in that way. The, the economics of, of the F&B model are getting extremely tighter, margins getting smaller with you know, landlords, the prices of real estate only rising. And I know that's very similar in a lot of international markets. Um, around the world, but it just seems obviously the UK starting from a higher base um, with Brexit um, for whatever that's brought um, and the embarrassment to the UK <laughs> business from my perspective um, is it, it's raised the price of importing goods. We were chatting about that as a consideration for Losteria coming in. It's um, wages have gone up. So if you just take from a starting point as a UK operator between living wage and, national, and London living wage, the importation costs going off of raw ingredients, before you actually even look at any external factors, you know, looking for like for like growth, etc., you, you can suddenly have wiped off a million, two million off your profitability without doing anything. It doesn't even matter about your operations. Um, so I, I, I sort of look at the UK and, and listening and chatting to brands and say, well, why wouldn't you be looking into markets such as the Netherlands or Germany, where from a branded perspective, there are complexities, finding partners, etc. But there feels to be to be more opportunity in these markets because if I look at the casual dining scene and the dining scene in the UK and the high street, it feels quite mature, where there is when I was looking for Jamie's um, and okay, still for Vapiano, I still feel that there's greater growth potential um, within, the, within the European markets other than the UK. Yesterday we met uh, Pesca, we met Avocado <coughs> Show, we met uh, The Butcher, the Donny Loco, all great fast casual concepts who, whose dream is probably to open a store in, in London. If you would be their investor, their friend, their mentor, go ahead, wait, pause, find another country. What's, a, uh, what's your personal recommendation? Not to counter what I've kind of just said when talking about opportunities, but if you are desperate to get into the UK, London is London, and a good friend. So would you invest? Would I invest? It depends on the concept and what the idea is. Good. Totally. So um, maybe you get a more precise answer from Nick in the, on, in, in the, in the, in the break. Uh, I, I think it's quite tricky. We, we saw all of the, the guys struggling and closing down, but on the other hand, you have great success stories there. So Johannes, uh, you're the German guy on stage, yes. so although you represent Losteria, what did the great story? Uh, you celebrated now your 20th uh, anniversary, a uh, big celebration in Germany because it's uh, uh, one of the uh, very few um, very successful German concepts selling Italian lifestyle. Uh, and you start growing now, huge white space in front of you. But from the German classes on. You saw the, the results of the survey, not a big surprise, basically low price point, very difficult to find a partner, but a big market if you crack it. I mean, if you count together around uh, 90 uh, Vapianos, around 90 Losteria, there's 180 fast casual Italian would make good money there. What's your point of view on the German market and what would you recommend concepts to look in? What's the watch out? What's the upside on the German market? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having us um, as the smallest concept on the stage with 105 restaurants. 
Um, the German market, a lot has been said and was on, on the uh, map and the um, chart that we, sh uh, that we saw. The price point compared to uh, many other European countries is much, much lower. When I compare the prices that we are um, having in Germany to the Netherlands or France, it's 20 to 30 percent lower um, than the two neighboring countries. So on the one hand, you've got the low price point. Some people say that rents are lower, but it's got to be level. So when you can, cannot earn as much money um, selling the same amount of pizza that you can sell, uh, that you can um, do in other countries, um, it's making the lower rent the same hurdle that you have in um, many other countries. Um, what we've seen throughout the last few years in Germany is that um, city centers are still attractive, but it doesn't always have to be Main Street um, or the high, high, high shopping street. Um, we've got a lot of restaurants working really, really well, what we call like around the corner from the main traffic. For us, and I think for many, many brands, some sort of visibility is extremely important, um, but that doesn't have to be the 100,000 people walking through the main shopping street in Munich, Frankfurt, or Berlin, um, for example. The second thing that um, I think we are really, really successful with in Germany at the moment is the standalone buildings that we have. Free standards. So the free, what we call free standards. Everyone knows them from McDonald's, from uh, KFC, but we are one of the few um, full service concepts in Germany that has and can offer um, a free standard for its franchisees as well because people are traveling more, going back and forth from home to um, where they work. So and we are located then at junctions, at high, high roads, at, uh, near, near the Autobahn, where we've got some visibility again. People can stop by, take something with them, or stay there and eat there. So I think that's moving forward, not only for countries like France, which are way more um, developed when it comes to that, but even for Germany, um, a great way of um, expanding. And when I look at the 30 restaurants that we've got ahead of us this year, um, it's probably half of them this year will be free standards, which has never been done by us before. Perfect. Before we come to the second round of specific questions, I want to ask an open question again based on, because I was hosting the Strentos with all these great concepts and we talked about before how many great concepts are now uh, coming out of Amsterdam and they're all uh, uh, out there having their first five, six, seven, eight restaurants re ready to grow, ready to grow international. You as very experienced uh, colleagues what recommendation you would give them? What, uh, if you would be their uh, supervisor, report member, the investors, all of them know what they're doing. Should they stay here? Should they keep on growing here? Ignore all the international attempts to sign a, a franchising contract or would you say to them, go ahead? Anybody wants to, to pick that question? Any recommendation for the young entrepreneurs uh, there? So what I would, so what I would say, uh, Make sure your brand is distinctive. I think that you know uh, it, it's something that uh, sometimes we have a tendency to forget about. About just finding something that makes our brand different uh, than what anybody else is doing. Uh, I think it's cr it's critical. So that will be uh, the, the first piece of advice. The second thing is, uh, I think that you know in some cases the the growth for the sake of growth is is overestimated, and uh, there is still a big potential within the existing business, which sometimes we forget about. So, uh, for example, uh, we use a very simple principle at Amrest that we always start with the asset, with the quality of assets. Whether we have the right type of assets, we have the right profile of assets, if our assets are still relevant for customers. So that's the, that's the rule number one. The rule number two is operations. Do we have the right operations? And, uh, and obviously that's the, probably the most difficult part. Uh, we, talk a, we talk a little bit about the labor and uh, the challenges with the labor markets, uh, which is pretty much visible anywhere right now in U.S., uh, Europe. So, so having the right operations can make the brand, uh, can make the, uh, the significant change in terms of the performance of the brand. The third, the third aspect that we're looking at, do we have a good value? And what I mean by value, it doesn't mean the low price, but something that, you know, when people will feel great about when they spend their money. And the last piece is innovation. And, you know, this is sort of the order uh, that, that when we think about brands uh, that, we, that we are applying, uh, again, I, I think sometimes there is a tendency of jumping into the innovation without having a good operations and a good value, uh, which I think is, uh, can actually get into some troubles. Thank you. Malayne, you want to yeah, address? If you look at uh, expanding a brand, I would really focus on uh, if there is a market for it, of course. So looking at consumer data, consumer research, uh, if you look at the figures of ABN AMRO, if you expand that outside the Netherlands, 
then please make sure that you're tar targeting the right target group and consumer demands. And, and we use a portfolio analysis for that. And then secondly, it's location. You know, uh, all the financials are impacted by where you put the brand, which location it is, and is it serving the consumer need? That would be my two tips. Thank you. Nick, yeah. you wanted to add? Yeah, I think I'm totally agreeing with everything you're sort of saying there. And just to further that, I think once you've, you've done your internal assessment about brand and the value and the, 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 the operations behind it, understanding your DNA when moving internationally, I was talking about this at the uh, session yesterday morning on franchising, know your DNA and what's core and then where you're willing to flex mm -hmm. when you go internationally, if you're going to make that choice. Because although geographically sometimes very close and there's no sort of borders between uh, it within Europe, we are, we are different just in terms of uh, consumers and our behaviors, and even from different cities, even within the same country. So for me, I think what I've experienced is know, know your DNA, know what's core, because at some point, whether you're with a partner, they will challenge you on that. And you have to have confidence to understand what the value of your brand is in its DNA when meeting a consumer demand. Um, because you will need to flex internationally. And you have to be confident to know where you can or can't do. Um, and then I think, obviously, chatting uh, or finding the right partner, sure. whether that's franchise, whether that's joint venture, or indeed the personnel to assist you, I think finding somebody to, that has good local knowledge and is a strong partner and understands your brand is, is absolutely crucial. It comes down to people um, in the end of the day. You can have the best concept in the world, best looking restaurant, but without the right people either partnering or running it, it will fall flat. Mm. Janis, when you now look at the, you, you're the smallest concept you said, but that means you also have a huge white space to grow. Yeah. And you have Europe in front of you. You've proven the business model in the German speaking world basically, yep. if you want to, to extend that. So how you analyze now, what's the next step to do? If you now look, at, you could go to Spain, you can go to France, you can go to Central Eastern Europe, you can go to Portugal. How, how you pick the next step? Well, we sort of have already picked them with um, opening uh, the first restaurant in France in November um, last year. And we look at France as one of the most interesting growing markets for us. One reason is, as I said, the freestander that um, we have and the freestander happy country that um, France is. Um, the, sp the spending habits when it goes out from eating out are even more attractive and appealing um, than they are in Germany and France. The price point is a little higher, rents are a little higher, but at the end, when we looked at it, the business model that um, we have in Germany works quite similar um, in France. Um, and so that was the reason why, and it's a big country with a lot of potential, um, of course, um, as one of the um, growing markets uh, moving forward. Perfect, thank you. So we have one more question, then open question, but I want to give the chance. Is there any specific question you want to ask the panel? Any questions from the room? Okay, then let me pick one more. We talked about the country, how to pick it how the operation, how to screen the concept, but we haven't really looked so deep into how to pick the right partners. All of you are franchisee, franchisors, and, and we all always, how we, how we pick the right partners. And again, here are young concepts who need to decide with whom to sign, and it's always very attractive if somebody comes with a big check and say, I love your concept and I want to bring it to my country, and I write your big check. What's the, what's the learnings you want to share if how to pick a partner? We need to keep it short because we don't have so much time, but the main learnings, how to keep a partner, start now here and go there. Nick, you did a lot of picking partner for Jamie, now you're taking over by piano. What's the first criteria you apply? I think to not take the biggest check that you just said there. <laughs> um, you know, we had a couple of words thrown around, being greedy, etc. I think it's, it's not all about money and it can't sound glitzy and glory. Um, going internationally, but it is all about the right people, the right partner. Um, how do you pick them? There's spending time with them and understanding their business model, their success, and their track record. Um, you can... You can't rush the process. It's about ingraining yourself and understanding their business and their track record. It's about them understanding your business and... and where your values are and your DNA and growing it, and then looking together at the market. I think if you're spending enough time with them that you feel that they can offer you um, 
a good roadmap and a good partnership and a stable partnership in a market, that's, that's a sort of, cre well, that's the eventual criteria. There's a number of steps in there. I would never just look at, do they have real estate knowledge? Do they just have the capital to do it? Are they interested in my brand? Do they have experience? I think you set your criteria, but then ultimately, um, it's about the time you spend with them and evaluating them um, from thereafter. Let me modify for the middle part of the panel the question, how you pick the brands, what you become franchisee? Uh, because you're a franchisor and franchisee, and we have another uh, only franchise. So I want to, to know from you, Ola, when, you, when you're thinking about licensing a brand and bringing it into your territory, how you screen the concept and the people behind that you sign the contract as a franchisee, what's your parameter on there? Uh, so first of all, we, we want to make sure that the brand that we that we plan to bring is going to be um, incremental uh, to, to our current portfolio. So uh, we, if you look at the franchise, we, we probably wouldn't take the brand which operates within the same segment. So it has to be complementary to what we have. I think also in today's, in today's environment, uh, we also have to make sure that the, the brand that we, will, that we are choosing is going to fit into our strategy. Uh, which consists of a few pillars, including the digital and the supply chain. So those are the things which uh, which would go beyond just the the traditional the, the traditional definition of okay, this brand is sexy, so I'm going to take it, right? So we'll have to f we'll have to see how much it is going to fit in terms of uh, in terms of um, all the pillars with the, the way how we how we operate um, our company. And obviously, you know. The, just, just seeing the track record of the brands and, and you know the reputation of the franchisor is critical. And uh, I would totally echo what uh, what Nick was saying about about the importance of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, whether we are a franchisee or we are a franchisor, we're talking about a marathon. We're not talking about sprint here. Mm -hmm. So we have to s set up our mindset, uh, you know, in that frame, uh, which sometimes will, will make the process a little bit longer than, than you would like to, because everybody would like to grow fast. But I think that you know, just being very, very cautious about the relationship that you are building is, 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 is critical, both for fran as a franchise or as a franchise. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which brands are you looking for, and what, is there any specific cuisine you're looking at the moment, and how you choose it from a from a um, guest experience wise, how you choose your brands? So if you look at the, the promise we deliver as HMSOs International, it's boosting business, creating places to be. So I can't uh, value one brand because we really would like to boost the business by creating places to be. And that's about the experience. And how we do that is uh, returning attention. So if we work with brands, we look for this partnership. We look for this personalization. Um, and then uh, a lot of brands match, but as, as we've heard yesterday as well, we are in an emotional business as well. But if we can build on the relationship and boost the business, then the brand uh, we can work with uh, to grow business outside, Thank internationally. You. Johannes, what do people need to bring to sign with you? Um, to, um, to, to the main two things, what they need to bring? Money well, and? Love for people, love for food. Good. That's a good ending of the panel, guys. Thank you for, for listening to us. Take the chance to grab them in the, in the break. Very knowledgeable, guys. Thank you so much for being on stage with us. Thank, Thank you for having us. Well done. So now I'd like to welcome my friend Luca on stage. Luca.